Hi, good evening. Today we're going on a magical journey of fitness myths and therefore I will be giving you the correct communication of exercise science which I believe can help you in your fitness journey. And this video is intended for informational purposes only. I know I do look a bit weary today. I was out late until 9pm last night watching the local superhero show. To be fair on Mike, his take on the situation was funny. The two issues I'm going to talk about are ice baths for recovery and therefore muscle growth. And the key deeper question will be optimization versus adaptation and actually the trade-off between potential recovery and muscle growth. And I'll just start with the main information. The best thing about ice baths is that the excuse, is it cold in here, can actually be used. And the second issue will be this nonsensical, archaic depiction that if a woman lifts weight, she's going to look like this. And whilst that's stupid and doesn't necessarily need a video of its own, I'm going to take that issue and discuss it in relation to the muscle building potential of women. And also the myth of if you increase your natural levels of T, you're going to increase your muscle growth potential per se in a linear fashion. And that's just not correct. Let's start with an archaic and condescending myth that if a woman lifts weight, she's going to turn into the Hulk. And of course, it's absolutely nonsensical rubbish. And I do feel extremely uncomfortable discussing it. However, this idea that a woman, if she lifts weights, will turn into something that looks like this is just as stupid that if a man lifts weights, he'll turn into something that looks like this. This is an extreme physique example, which is not naturally attainable. And where exactly this idea has come from is probably in relation to many social issues, which to be real, I'm probably not the right person to talk about. When it comes to the question of how much muscle you can grow, I actually think communicating on an individual basis, a case to case basis, how much I can grow is the better way of communicating it. However, of course, it's heavily genetically based, but that depends on the person. And I have a specific video on this where I discuss some of the issues that contribute to how much muscle you can grow naturally. Natural muscular potential is influenced by the size of your frame. Based on a few simple calculations, you can get a pretty good idea of your muscular and strength potential. Muscle and bone are intrinsically linked. Muscle to bone ratio is a very good model, but it's not very useful are friendly and it's hard to conduct. And so then we get to the last model, Casey Butts maximum muscular potential model. Again, imagine how many takes it took me to say that name. And so Dr. Butt analyzed natural bodybuilders and he found a strong relationship between people's wrist circumference, their ankle circumference and their muscular potential. And so Greg's analysis is that this model is perhaps not as useful as the muscle to bone ratio, but it's more user friendly. It's far easier for you to perform and therefore it is a good calculation for you to consider. And indeed resistance training, if you are a man or a woman is of course valuable, but of course resistance training can come in many forms. And so whilst it's nonsense to say if a man or a woman lifts weights, they're gonna turn into this. It's also nonsense to say that if a woman lifts weights, she cannot grow muscle. The idea that women cannot grow significant muscle is rubbish and that those tiny pink weights are for women is dumb and dumber level dumb. But also on the other end of the spectrum, a woman is not going to grow those supra physiological levels of muscle mass if they are training naturally using weights. And so if you are a woman watching this, you are going to grow in proportion to your frame. If you're a man watching this, you are going to grow in proportion to your frame. It is on a case to case basis. One issue that people will instantly come to now is that women generally speaking again, have lower test levels than men. And that is an accurate statement to make. To be clear, test is absolutely a natural anabolic substance. Absolutely it is. And so I now want to change the topic slightly and talk to the men specifically in relation to this obsession with men looking to increase their test levels naturally to build further muscle. Here is the problem with test. People just assume that the more test you produce naturally, the more muscle growth potential you have. Now, I want to be clear, I'm talking about natural T levels that are produced biologically within your body. And so here's the key point that I think is butchered in online fitness information. If you have low test levels, absolutely increasing that to normal range will affect, can affect your muscle growth potential. But if you are in that normal range of T levels, then increasing within that normal range is not going to have a significant impact on your muscle growth potential. It just is not. This is not a direct linear relationship. If you are in those normal test levels, it will be external substances which would then 
produce the much greater growth potential. This is what is known as supraphysiological levels of test. Now, of course, this is a natural channel. So of course, that's not something I would ever recommend or directly promote. And so just be clear that it's not a direct cause and effect linear relationship per se. The more test you have does not equal more muscle growth outright. However, deficiency and the normal range may have a difference, but within that normal range, that's not going to be your key factor for muscle growth. What is the key consideration for your muscle growth? Well, it's the muscle building principles. Again, the repeated contractions, the hammering on your training, the stress of the muscle fibers with the dynamic contraction, the muscle damage, metabolic stress, mechanical tension that you're building up through this repeated work in the gym, your protein intake, your energy balance, and the hypertrophy of the muscle fibers through the increase of sarcomeres in parallel. This is what you're focusing on. The actual work you are doing in the gym is the focus and of course your nutrition to support that growth stimulus and actually one factor that may also differ between growth potential is how hard the people are actually working in the gym again this is another example of how it's very much on an individual basis that we should view this this obsession with comparing ourselves to others is something that i just simply do not understand i'm strongly of the view that we should just focus on developing what we have to the best of our ability onto the ice treatment cold water immersion ice baths, cold treatment. The idea that you sit in an ice bath post-workout to aid with your recovery after your sessions to then help with the subsequent productivity in future sessions. And I depicted this on the thumbnail by using Mr. Freeze, as you do. And we have many famous athletes that use this. And we also have celebrities such as Kevin Hart who interviews people in an ice bath. And my point there is, is that it's just a very well-known protocol. This is not some dark mysterious protocol that I've just pulled out of a corner. This is evident everywhere all over the internet. In terms of the actual recovery potential of cold water immersion, that is actually questionable when we look at the evidence base. Yes, cold water immersion has been shown to decrease muscle soreness. And the question is, is cold water immersion actually better than just a regular cool down protocol? For example, peak it out, the cold water immersion was not superior for recovery compared to 10 minutes of low intensity cycling. However, there is data to suggest that cold water immersion can decrease muscle soreness, uh, such as in the meta-analysis by Lida et al. 2011. This review illustrates that CWI is an effective strategy to reduce DOMS following a range of exercise types. However, the actual significance of the ice baths in relation to just a regular post-workout cool-down protocol is highly questionable and debatable and most likely not greatly significant. And so I just want to put that out there first. But in addition, how much soreness you feel is actually quite a subject measure. So that's just one example of how this research interpretation can be problematic. However, that's not the point of my video. I actually want to discuss optimization versus adaptation. If you are optimizing, you are not adapting. And this is a great example. Now I want to use the scenario of muscle building. Let's say you're in a muscle building phase. The ice bath is a recovery protocol after your muscle building workout to then help you to train hard in the subsequent sessions, again, for this muscle building goal. But there's actually research to suggest that an ice bath or cold water immersion can decrease muscle adaptation towards muscle growth. Cold water immersion attenuated long-term gains in muscle mass and strength. It also blunted the activation of key proteins and satellite cells in skeletal muscle up to two days after strength exercise. And this is what Dr. Contreras had to say about this piece of research. As you can see, this evidence is extremely damning. It seems like we all got gurued. Jumping into a cold tub after a hard workout hampered our gains by slowing down the normal rate of progress in terms of satellite cell and mTOR pathway activation, strength acquisition, and muscle fiber hypertrophy. And so very simply broken down, cold water immersion can decrease muscle, muscle adaptation in relation to muscle growth which would be an unwanted side effect of the treatment. And so that is optimizing versus adaptation. With many things you do in your training, many of the decisions you make with your training and your recovery, there is a trade-off. There's an upside and a downside. The upside is, well, this may help with muscle soreness, but the downside is this may inhibit your muscle growth potential. And so if you are someone that is in a muscle building phase, my recommendation would be to not use cold water immersion or ice baths 
due to this optimizing versus adaptation question that we have in front of us. And indeed, you can consider using a more traditional cool down protocol. And so what I want you to take away is not just the information in relation to these questions, but how may you apply these concepts to your other fitness questions that you may have. And so I'm James Linker. This is Shred Sports Science. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you soon.